adopted this term called spiritual bypassing. And I'm not sure if, if that would be uh, an example of that when you, when you, I'm not sure what spiritual bypassing actually means. Well, spiritual bypassing actually refers to playing kind of a mental trick or a mental game where you can avoid dealing constructively with something or for that matter, accepting its reality and dealing with it all by using spiritual ideas and spiritual principles to bypass that. Now, that bypassing can include suppressing your emotions and convincing the yourself that the repressed emotions are actually not repressed but are gone because of your spiritual attainment. Yeah. But it can be everything, spiritual bypassing can include everything from repressing your own emotional reactions, using spiritual principles to do that, to refusing to deal with real problems that you have and problematic behaviors that you have by rationalizing them away in the same way. That's what spiritual bypassing is. So you could, for example, use spiritual bypassing. You know, some people's reaction to learning that someone has uh, cancer, you know, death, when somebody has died, it's really hard to deny that for very long, right? People can deny it for a little while. It's hard to, you know, um, so the denial and bargaining part can't be sustained very long. When, when somebody's diagnosed with cancer, the denial and bargaining can go on a long, long time, right? And so, and the, the pain and the anger and the grief take on a different form in, in this place where you're still, you know, maybe it's not true. Maybe it's a mistake. Or maybe if it is, maybe the, you know, maybe there's some cure that they don't know about. Or, you know, there's all these other kinds of things that you can come up with. So um, I don't, it doesn't sound to me like that's what you were doing at all, was it? Well, I, yeah, I was just, I think it's just, um, mm -hmm. my mind has really a way of always trying to, yeah, see some things from the negative side. Um, but I'm also aware of that and seeing when that is also happening. All human beings are predisposed to see things from a negative perspective. No exceptions. Mm. But one of, one of the things that changes as a result of these insight knowledges that lead to awakening is that that becomes less so. Um, and as the Buddha said, and I have repeated many times, this dharma is good in the beginning and good in the middle and good in the end. It's not just good in the end or even just good in the middle and the end. It's good in the beginning. As soon as you start practicing it, you will be able to deal in a more healthy way with things that come up. You will, somebody who's awakened, their response to a cancer diagnosis, their own or their sister's, um, or just about anything else is going to be, ah, so this is the way it is. All right, what, what can I do about this? Uh, is, is there any, what should I do and what can I do? Uh, if there's nothing that I can and should do, then I just need to accept it for what it is and be willing to do what I can if the occasion should arise. That is the way an awakened person reacts. Okay. So, yeah, it would make sense for an awakened person. It would make sense to ask the question, well, is there any possibility this diagnosis is a mistake? You know, that's a reasonable thing to do. And as a matter of fact, it's what, uh, it, it's what a detached, non-involved, you know, a good physician would do is let me, let's validate this in some other ways. Let's call in another specialist, whatever, whatever is appropriate. And the question of what to do about it. What are the steps that can be taken? You know, those are all reasonable and legitimate things. Those aren't denial and bargaining. They're different. The sensible denial and bargaining is when you're coming from this emotional place of non acceptance, of struggling against, of suffering, of resistance. So, even in the beginning of your practice, you will benefit in these kinds of situations by even by being able to 
approach the situation in a more wholesome manner. But you don't need to be afraid of awakening. Take my word for it. It's going to be better than anything you ever think. And anything you've ever heard or read or imagined that might make you think it's, not, it's going to be some way unpleasant or undesirable or that you'll regret it, that's absolute nonsense, okay? That's All right. I, I think also I should, I think sometimes it's better when I just don't try to imagine what it's like and just go with it until it well, presents itself. Yeah. It's as you begin to gain more insight and as you study the Dharma, where you'll gain an intellectual understanding of, of uh, these insight realizations, it is worth trying to imagine in a constructive and wholesome way what these are like. So you don't want to, to drop it in, but anything that's sort of idle speculation or I wonder, or, oh, I hope not, or, you know, maybe this is a mistake. Maybe I don't want to go there. Don't do that. Cultivate, train yourself. When you find yourself going into that, I mean, that's what the negative predisposition of your mind is going to incline you to do from time to time. Just that starts happening. You just, hey, think about something else. Turn it off. Say, well, what am I doing? You know, I don't know. I don't know this. I, you know, why am I imagining what it might be like and coming up with something? Why, why would uh, millennia of people have sought after this, you know, in many different traditions around the globe? Why would so many people have sought this if it was something going to turn out to be something horrible? Somewhere along the line, they would have figured out that it was horrible and they would have told everybody else, right? That's true. That's true. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's go on here. Let's see. Oh, well. Our dinner is here. Okay. Um, there's somebody here earlier that seems to be gone. All right. Thanks, so, um, Well, Gunnar has a question right after yours. Okay. Morning, Gunnar. How are you? Morning, Chilalesa. I'm good. You're looking fresh, looking good. <laughs> uh, sometimes that can, my appearances can be an illusion. <laughs> anyway, you say there's, uh, sometimes there appears an awareness of the narrating mind in tandem with a feeling which one might name conscience. Sometimes these two even talk to each other. In the body, it seems this conscience is connected to the stomach region where waves of feeling of fear and joy get in sync with the tummy's subtle uprightness and relaxation. It's more of a feeling rather than a muscular contraction per se. So what is this conscience? Well, yeah, let's examine what it could be. This, your mind is taking some real <coughs> experience that's arising within your mind and it's trying to interpret it. And not unreasonably, it tries to locate it in space and time. And, but what it, especially when it's something that, you know, if it can talk to the part of your mind that has been doing the cognizing uh, and the and maybe the self-talk already. I mean, it's, it's quite obvious it's another part of your mind in some sense or another, right? If the part of your mind that was, that you were experiencing consciously as you um, represents uh, some coalition of sub-minds in that moment, well, what's happened here is another coalition of sub-minds has formed and it can even enter into dialogue. And I suppose that the, your experiences are both some, uh, some positive reinforcement and some uh, sort of negativity or, or doubt or things like that. That's probably why you call it conscience. 
Am I not right? Okay. So what you're having a very direct experience of is some parts of your mind system that are sometimes in agreement with other parts and sometimes in disagreement. And of course, when we use the term conscience, that's exactly what we're what we're doing, right? Some parts of us want to and like this, and other parts are saying, hey, wait a minute, though, this might not be so good. Yeah, that's conscience. Um, now, it's interesting that in many traditions, um, the the ego, the hara, uh, you know, the chakra, the center, uh, like in the in the system of uh, of uh, chakras and and uh, uh, nerve channels or nadis, you know that this this is uh, um, this is recognized, but also in the Dawa system of of chi and the flows of chi, it's the same thing. You know, like in martial arts, this is the center of power and things like that. That's what that means is where you're locating it physically isn't just purely something that your mind is projecting and could be different in anybody else, but rather it's a reflection of something that people have noticed over and over again many times, but that our minds tend to locate this, this other center as often being in the abdomen. So these are just some alternative ways that we can understand this. But um, yeah, if you, you say it seems to have some relationship between between the, the uh, uh, what's happening, you know, anatomically, physically, in the abdominal area, but you recognize that it's something other than just a muscular contraction per se. Anyway, your final question is what is this conscience? Um, have I answered that to your satisfaction? Yes, you have. Actually, in, in the very first sentences, uh, they're both different parts of the same mind or different sub minds. And I, and when they talked to each other, I was identifying with one of them, but not with the other. That's and right. that's just the process of identification. That makes no sense. Yeah. Um, one of the mistakes that you can make, and when this happens, and if you think about it, it happens all the time, but you're because it happened in the circumstances it did, you were much more acutely aware of it than you otherwise be. There's a tendency to jump to the conclusion that one part of the one part of your mind system may be wiser and more correct than the other. Uh, sometimes this is true, but it's not always true, right? You know, so if you keep that in mind, then uh, instead of these two parts of your mind, one trying to intimidate the other and saying, you know, the, you know, I am conscience and I am right, and you are coming from some place of uh, greed and desire and potential evil, uh, you know, you let that aside and say, okay, we've got a different point of view. Let's see if we can work this out. <laughs> Let's see which one of us really is uh, operating on some, some better grounds and, and, and how we can guide, how we can guide our uh, behaviors and actions based on that. As, as you know, a lot of times many people listen to their conscience and they not, don't necessarily do what's good for them. So. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. I've, uh, I would find myself even bargaining, or at least one sub mind bargaining with the other sub mind, trying to avoid these feelings of uncomfort, discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to avoid pain, right? Or suffering um, instead of just accepting. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Yeah. You're welcome. So, I guess Amit is the next person who has a question. And actually, I think your question was posed uh, fairly early on. So we're not really taking you out of sequence, are we? Uh, let me just find this question.
All right. Can you, I, I found it, uh, I don't know whether this was a post that only shows up on my screen or whether you, the rest of you can also see it. Can you see the post from Ahmed? He made 542 this morning. No, I think my comment was deleted from the uh, uh, below of the Zoom link. For some reason, it gets deleted. So I posted it from chat. Maybe I can uh, post it again, comments. OK, well, I, I'll read the question and I'll, I'll try to read it with a mind that, you, that the rest of you can't necessarily read along. OK. Um, he said, I'm having difficulties on perceiving the environmental stimuli clearly and on setting a strong intention to perceive the details of these stimuli and eventually the breast sensations in the nose. Also in finding a balance between activeness and passiveness in four-step transition. So you're, you're talking specifically about the four-step transition here, but of course the same challenges would show up in other circumstances. You say, when I intend to spend more time in environmental stimuli and push myself to be actively in search of a sound or bodily sensation to examine its details with attention, the strong intention to perceive the details of a particular stimulus usually don't arise. Maybe it's partly due to the fact that usually the environmental stimuli around me are familiar and not stable and not attractive. So, okay, yes, that's so. Let's put, are you just to clarify, are you talking about the transition from step one to step, step two? Actually, I'm not uh, following this exact sequence, like. I, uh... Actually, I have just one step of transition, like just one state of uh, trying to be present and uh, exploring around, then uh, skipping to nose. Okay. When you're trying to be present, this means that you want to have a relatively expansive awareness and a relatively clear awareness. So you're aware of the background, you're aware of, well, you're aware of the field of conscious awareness to a greater degree, even if you're focusing your attention on one thing, right? I mean, I have uh, discovered two approaches to uh, apply here, like I, uh, I have written the other one as well. Um, so it differs from session to session. I mean, what I do. Uh, I'm having trouble understanding you. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I said uh, I have. Uh, I am using two different approaches to usually apply in this transition step. Uh, I have written the other one uh, as well. Uh, like it's the more passive one, uh, more um, open awareness kind of one. Um, so I didn't. Uh, get the exact question, by the way. Okay. Well, open awareness is, this is something that you can't practice effectively until you have a, a reasonably well-developed awareness and you have considerable control over attention, right? Because what you're really trying to do in the practice of open awareness, and I think it's unfortunate when people are introduced to this practice before they've developed the basic skills, what you're really trying to do is to draw upon this conscious power that you've developed through the practice that will allow you to sustain, sustain an open, you know, broad and clear awareness um, with uh, with sufficient clarity and sufficient power that you don't slip into dullness, because this is what's going to always happen. Uh, other than that, is 
is you're going to go into the state of awareness and it's going to gradually create more and more adults. If I'm not mistaken, a little farther along in your question, you actually say this is what happens to you, right? Yes. Now, well, what happens earlier when you're learning to work with awareness and to sustain it is because it's your intention to have a clearer awareness and a broader awareness, your attention wants to jump in and do that. So it's going to want to jump in and drill into this sound and drill into this sensation and drill, right? And that actually does help you to develop awareness, but it's not awareness. When attention is jumping around to all these different things in the field of awareness and drilling into them, that's not awareness. It is something that can be a useful prelude to awareness because after attention has done that, awareness becomes broader and it becomes clearer and it becomes more stable. So if you can mute attention and, and cause attention to back off, then you can enjoy the state of more open awareness. But um, that comes after attention becomes muted and kind of set aside. Okay. What happens before that is, is that this is just an activity of attention. It's trying to substitute for awareness, but it it can't, but it can lead to enhanced awareness. This is really what the, uh, the first step and the second step in this transition do. Uh, well, actually, they're all working towards this. But in the first step, you just open yourself up to everything that you feel, hear, sense, what your mind is doing, what's happening around you. That's the awareness component. And you let your attention first go wherever it wants, and you just kind of observe that with awareness. Oh, this is how my attention is behaving. And then you start intentionally placing attention here and examining this sensation, placing your attention there and examining that sensation, you know, whether it's a mental or physical sensation. But you explore these different things in awareness using attention. This is going to increase the breadth and the clarity of your awareness. You move into the second step. And in the second step, you're going to restrict movements of attention to just the sensations of the body, not sounds, not smells, uh, not any other things that, that might come up, just sensations in the body. Now, less so than before, uh, thoughts, feelings, and other mental objects. You let those be an awareness. You let everything be an awareness that was in the first step, but now you're confining the movements of attention. Well, the third step is more of the same. Because you've let attention go anywhere in the body, now your bodily awareness is a very bright, clear, part of your overall awareness. Your extrospective awareness and your bodily awareness are bright and clear moving into the third step. Now, when I say this, this is going to qualitatively change the way you experience these first three steps, depending on how long you've been doing this and how well developed your attention is or how well developed your stability of attention is and how well developed your awareness is. When you've been doing this for six months, uh, at the beginning of every sit, you're going to have really, <laughs> the experience is going to be one of really brilliant and powerful awareness. And it's going to get better all the time. But no matter where you are, even the very first time you do it, there is going to be, you know, in the, in the second step, you enhance one aspect of awareness. So that when you, uh, of, yes, of awareness. So when you go to the third step, where you're only allowing attention to fall upon or be directed towards sensations in the body related to the breath, you're gonna still be able to sustain this bright, clear, open awareness, right? You know what I'm saying? And then, yes. you, and then you get to the okay. fourth step and you're gonna focus just on the sensations of the breath at the nose, nothing else. Lo and behold, you've got this powerful awareness to work with. So this is all a prelude to how you're going to use these things in every stage of the practice. You're going to be 
exercising attention against a background, a very broad, clear, open awareness. And you get better and better at it, and it'll allow you to recognize uh, movements of attention that are inappropriate. It'll allow you to recognize dullness arising. Uh, it'll allow you to recognize the kinds of distraction that are trying to capture awareness. In other words, all the things that you learn to employ more and more effectively as, as you progress through the stages. Does, does this make sense, first of all, of your experience? And secondly, does it uh, uh, help you to understand how to work with these things? I mean, it makes sense in theory, but I mean, it's usually hard to uh, exactly apply in sessions like, because like when I uh, usually, uh, I don't tend to, uh, I mean, my attention does not tend to uh, go to this stimuli and this stimuli. Uh, like it's usually goes to if something if some intention arises it goes to this or like some verbal thoughts uh, arises it goes to this but like not to do sensations uh, and that's exactly what's supposed to happen what you are doing in this practice is that is awareness you become aware that your attention preferentially goes to some things and not others that is powerful awareness you know some things are much more attractive and interesting and easy to get into than others and you don't have to pick something like traffic noise and make it be as uh, and make your attention be as completely preoccupied with it as it would be with say uh, a pain in your knee they never going to happen but you're going to be able to be aware of, to recognize, to be cognizant of, it. wow, this is how my attention behaves. This is how it behaves all of the time. I can modify that, but it's still always going to be, attention is always going to preferentially lock onto some things more than others. That's going to help you understand why some distractions are much more powerful and can potentially make you forget the meditation object or potentially become gross distractions or later in the practice potentially become subtle distraction. Why are some things in the background more potent as distraction? Well, it's a reflection of how your attention, the normal behavior of attention. And what you're going to do is train attention to be, to, to respond more to intention rather than just do what it's always done in an uncontrolled manner. So what you're, what you're looking at now and you're saying is, wow, this is what my attention does and I can't make it do anything else. And um, instead of saying, oh, this is a problem, it's like you want to say, oh, this is how my mind works. If I'm going to, if I'm going to succeed in training my mind, I have to start from the recognition that this is how it works. I've got to work with that, right? How about now? Does that make more, more sense now? Yeah, thank you. All right, and you say, on the other hand, if I intend not to push myself to actively examine the environment with my attention, and you know, uh, the dullness comes on, right? usually results in progressive subtle dullness, which eventually results in sleepiness. That is the fruit of doing this practice. Aha, this is what happens. Okay, if I'm going to succeed in the practice, this is really valuable information because now knowing and understanding, and of course, the more you experience this and you, you rather than sinking into the dullness and losing perspective, but you can observe what's happening in your mind, then the more empowered you are going to be to effectively train your mind. Okay. So these are good observations. They are powerful and useful observations. But the point is not to 
go in there and forcefully try to make attention do something that it's not inclined to do naturally. The point is to train attention, taking into, into account that this is its natural pattern of behavior and work with it constructively to allow you to use attention and awareness to maximal effectiveness. To likewise notice what the tendency of the mind is with entering into a state of open awareness before you have sufficient mental power, the Pali word for this is virya. Before you have sufficient mental power or conscious power to sustain that without going into dullness, okay? you recognize, oh, this is the tendency. And what is the what is the uh, uh, the uh, antidote to that? Well, it's having the conscious power to be able to observe the larger process and meditate cognitive awareness without sinking into dullness. Okay, yeah, let me see. Is, is there is there anything more in your experience and what you've been trying to what you've been what you're asking for assistance with that that you would like further clarification on? Maybe just on uh, the strong intention part, I, because I, I have noticed that if my intention is somehow strong to examine something it mm -hmm. usually succeeds in examining, yeah. but like, it doesn't arise uh, usually. Like I can't make it happen. That's right. You can't. And that's a very important point. All you can do is form and hold the intention. Other things have to happen as a result of that in order for, in order for the intention to be fulfilled. But to the degree that you succeed in holding the intention such that to some degree it becomes realized it's going to become easier to do every time you do that every time an intention is fulfilled it becomes easier to do so but other things have to happen you know um for your arm to move off of the arm of your chair for you to lift your arm it's an intention that starts the process but a thousand different little things, a million other things have to happen before your arm will actually be in the air beside you, right? And any of those things that are not there, your arm won't ultimately end up where you intend it. I mean, how many times have you lifted your arm to do something and it hit something else or it didn't work out, right? You know, uh, anytime an intention is fulfilled, it's because of all the other things that happen. So you can, the the only thing you know I mean, once again we're dealing with something here you're perceiving yourself as a doer i'm making something happen but the more the way to get more effective in bringing about the desired result which ultimately involves letting go of the idea of there being any self that's doing this that's in charge that's where you're going in order to do that is to retreat from the idea of i'm doing this and if it doesn't work out, it's my fault. I failed, you know, uh, I failed in making happen what I intended to happen. You want to get away with it, away from that. Just drop it. It's, it's totally inaccurate. Uh, so you focus all of your effort, and then there always is effort to begin with, on, on forming and holding the intention. And everything else has to happen as a result of that. And if you try to make it happen, you're just getting in the way. So you want to stay back here and okay, it's not happening yet. Let me hold the intention. See if I can make it happen next time around. So you just focus on that part. And it's just like the thing that you intend to happen doesn't always happen. Well, it doesn't mean that that because you form an intention that it's going to hold, or that even you're going to succeed in forming as strong as intention as you would like to. Just keep doing it and you'll get better at it. Okay. So yeah. um, otherwise you say, oh, I, I give up. I keep trying to form this intention and I just can't. Yeah, that makes sense. It's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to go back to a list of questions here. Let's see. Um, the oldest question that we have is from Stefan. Stefan is not here today. And uh, Stefan says, I have recently read about the Vedana concept, and I'm wondering what you think about it, what you can get out of it when you understand the concept and know how to apply it in your meditation. Um, I also wonder if I can find elements of it in the book and where it fits in. I find Stefan's question confusing, and Stefan, maybe we can come back to this when you're present. And if I happen to forget it, then please remind me. I feel like you may mean something by this term Vedana concept that is different than what I think about. Um, it sounds like it sounds like a term that somebody else has generated to describe something else that they do or way they think about something. I, I don't know. Vedana is very simply the uh, feeling tone or valence that's associated with the arising of any mental object or any sensation, uh, any thought, so on and so forth. It, vedana is nothing other than pleasantness or unpleasantness or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. That is a quality that is associated with everything. Everything that you do, everything that you experience is going to be associated with one of, well, I can't, the, the three encompass everything. It's either pleasant or it's unpleasant or it's not either, right? There's no, there is no other alternative. So the, the, the basically it's a concept that the Buddha found useful and I find equally useful in order to deconstruct our experience moment by moment, is that when a mental, when an object arises in the mind, it can be a mental object, it can be a physical object such as a sensation, uh, but no matter what, it, it can be an intention, it can be an idea, whatever it is, a hope or a fear, whatever, it's going to be associated with some vedana, uh, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. So that's, that's the concept. It's just a concept, but it's a concept that's very useful in deconstructing or understanding our experience. This is one of the qualities that's present. It's enormously useful. It's the second of the four Satipatthanas, you know, Vedanupasana uh, as uh, the mindfulness of Vedanas as they rise and pass away. So I'm not sure what you mean by Vedana concept. I mean, yes, I find it extremely useful, extremely valuable. I don't address it explicitly because I don't find it. I didn't, at the time I was writing The Mind Illuminated, uh, feel that, that discussing the four Vedanas as such as practices was as useful as just employing them as a part of practices, but I could have. And if I write another edition, I might well have. They are implicit in so much of what you do in the mind illuminated. So they are there, but they're not explicitly there to the same degree. You will find reference to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral Vedanas, okay? But I think until you're here and I can ask you what you mean by the Vedana concept, I can't effectively answer your question. So until then, Stefan. Anybody else have any thoughts or anybody else heard of something called the Vedana concept that uh, may have some specific meaning in terms of a practice and experience? I was only wondering whether or not he was referring to Vedanta as opposed to Vedana. Ah. That didn't occur to me. It could be. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll wait until he's with us and can clarify that. 
But that, that didn't occur to me. It could be, yes. Um, the Vedanta was a system that was well established long before the Buddha came along. And um, it refers to the, uh, it's, a, it's a system based in the, in the uh, Vedas, you know, the, the uh, holy scriptures of India that had developed uh, centuries and millennia over a period of millennia prior to the time of the Buddha and served uh, up to today in various forms as a basis for many of the uh, religions on the Indian subcontinent. So we'll look at Vedanta separately if that's what Stefan is referring to and we need to, okay? Um, I have a question from Pasquale, who is not here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I prefer to answer questions as much as I can when people are here, but, you know, he said at the end of his, of his post that uh, he may not be able to make it today. So I'll go ahead and look at this. <clears throat> So two questions about practice using breath sensations compared to loving kindness with regard to the stages, or at least up to stage seven. Uh, I understand that applying the advice is basically the same with regards to stable attention, but I tend to get confused at some point. For example, one can use breath sensations to see their impermanence and develop insight, or use them to go into jhanas and so on. But with loving kindness, or sometimes tong them in my case, besides bringing one's attention back to the object, what happens when one expands the scope of attention to include more and more people, places, worlds, etc.? Is there something more than just an attitude change? That would be my first question. So let's deal with that. Yes, uh, first of all, let's go to one can use breath sensations to see their impermanence and develop insight. Well, one can use the breath sensations to see their impermanence. Yes, they won't ever develop insight by seeing the impermanence of breath sensations. It's only going to occur if you begin to see the inklings of impermanence that extend beyond the breath sensations to everything else. That's where insight comes. Um, you're looking at breath sensations. And if you look at them long enough and hard enough, and especially if somebody has primed you to say, oh, you're going to see impermanence, oh, you're going to, you know, um, then what you're going to see is, yes, these, these sensations, they rise and pass away. And, and then you begin, you begin to see even what your consciousness of any particular sensation is, it, it's transient. Well, if you keep looking at it, you'll see not only that it's transient, but that it was never there, that it was already as it arose. It was just a process of change. There's some point where your mind identified it as X sensation is there. And some point where your mind says, oh, that sensation is no longer there. But you come to realize, the real that X sensation never really existed. It was just this process that that I grasped as a certain kind of sensation for a certain period of time. But you know, it was already passing away even as it arose in my consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right? You can see that looking at the breath. It only can become, I mean, this is an experiential realization. But it doesn't count for very much as long as it only applies to the breath. It's only when you begin to see more and more different things in these terms that it can take on the quality of being an insight. And actually, impermanence is really a lousy name for this insight. And arising and passing away is not a very good name for this insight. And dissolution is not a very good name for this insight. They all describe the initial experiences of somebody who's 
solidly based in the perception of there being things, things that arise and pass away, things that undergo dissolution. As, as it insight, as it matures as insight, it's the realization that there really are no things. There is only process. There is only change. And then that is the real insight to impermanence. And then there's also the realization that the thingness that I impose on this process is not real, that my mental idea of that thing is empty. So this starts to be insight into emptiness. So, but those things won't mean anything at all if they only apply to breath sensations. It's only when your mind begins to notice that the same thing is true of other things and ultimately of everything. So you expand that. So let's go back to your question here. Uh, you're looking, okay, with loving kindness, uh, expand the scope of attention, include more and more people, places, and worlds. Uh, well, is that more, is that something more than just an attitude change? Yeah, yes, it is. It is an extremely important attitude change. And as a matter of fact, that attitude can change can only occur to the extent that that becomes insight. But, but what really, doing this process of loving kindness meditation, what insights is that conducive to? Well, first of all, you're moving more into this world of non-separateness, right? You're not just wishing happiness for yourself. You're not just wishing freedom of suffering for yourself. You're extending, extending this to people that are close to you, to people that are not so close to you, even people you don't like and get, don't get along with, even to complete strangers, even to sentient beings that you don't even have knowledge of in different parts of the universe, okay? To the degree that you can really get into that, to that degree, your mind has let go of the experience of being a separate self. And it will do so progressively the more you do that practice. Initially, it's this I, this ego self, that is sending this loving kindness to someone else. But if you keep repeating the practice, that notion of the separate I-ness begins to erode. As separateness begins to erode, two things are happening. There is developing an insight into anatta. There's an aspect of your perception of self that is beginning to dissolve. The other thing is that you're developing the insight into interconnectedness. You cannot do this practice, especially if you're doing things like you're thinking about times that you suddenly had some feeling of being at ease or being happy just to rise out of nowhere and you're visualizing someone else and you're sending them happiness and freedom from suffering and freedom from ill will and so forth and you imagine them experiencing what you've experienced okay and and you're, you're imagining that your intention is actually producing that and so on you're opening your psyche up to this kind of interconnectedness this is going to prepare your mind, call it an attitude if you want, to begin to see that this isn't just something you imagine. It's something that is really the case. It is really a much more accurate description of reality than is your idea of your ideas of separateness uh, and, and so forth. And, uh, and causal causality is some kind of linear uh, one-way process those begin to fall away. So loving kindness is very much an insight practice, and in some ways, a much more powerful and effective one than, than following the breath to discover impermanence. But it's easier for most people to recognize uh, in the sensations of breath to recognize impermanence and change. So that's why it is a very useful and, and commonly used approach to developing insight. All right. Well, anybody have any comments on that before I go on to the second part of Jared's question? Or not Jared, to the second part of Pasquale's question? 
I just downloaded a lot of stuff about insight that you may not have been familiar with previously. Okay. Well, let's see what the second part of Pasquale's question is. The second is, I find when doing this practice that there is a, there is a point when I will experience sensations throughout my body that is the same like whole body breathing. The thought then pops up, what do I do now? Should I drop everything and attempt jhana? No. Do I just keep doing the same thing, being unsure? Yeah. Do I just keep doing the same thing? Yes. Being unsure where this is supposed to go besides just stable attention. Um, replace that uncertainty or that unsureness with curiosity. Okay. So just keep doing the same thing, being curious where this might go. Uh, and even whether or not it goes to stable attention is still something that you that might happen, uh, that might have happened, but might not happen again. Might happen, but might not. Uh, be curious where it goes. And if it goes to stable attention, does that tell you anything? If it doesn't go to stable attention, as a matter of fact, if that's what you've expected, then if it doesn't and it goes somewhere else, then that's more likely to tell you even more than if it went to stable attention. So yeah, keep doing the same thing. Be open, inquisitive, curious. Don't analyze it. Don't try to figure it out. Just be open and observe. Ah, where is this going to go? What's going to happen? Ah, this is where it goes. This is what happens. Oh, what else can this tell me? Do I even want these bodily sensations? Well, I, I think you already know this, Pasquale, but no, you don't want them, nor do you not want them. Either one is the wrong thing to do. They're there. They might go away. So don't want them. Just be open to them being there and be open to them passing away. Don't want them. Certainly don't not want them try to make them go away, to want them not to be there? No, they're there. Let them be there. Examine them. See where they go. See where they don't go. Um, they may just fade away. That's fine. They may come back. But, you know, don't want them and don't want not want them, though. That's the wrong thing to do. Because you're wanting and you're not wanting, you know, you're going to end up making you feel dissatisfied, frustrated either because they do go away or they don't go away so you don't want to do that definitely uh, because they are different than the feelings related to happiness and somewhere along the line i swapped them without giving it much thought um, yes these are sensations they may not be physical sensations in the normal sense of the word but they appear in your mind as though they are physical sensations. Physical sensations are completely different from happiness or unhappiness. This is the Vedana that we were talking about earlier. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. So any feeling of any kind that arises is going to be associated with pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, okay? So these feelings are going to be associated with pleasant or unpleasant or neutral as well. Um, you say somewhere along the line, I swapped them without giving it much thought. Um, actually, it's wonderful that you noticed that. That's a good start. Next time it happens, now this time, don't give them any thought, but give them a lot more awareness. See, at one point, if there were feelings of happiness present, at what point did those those pleasant Vedana become neutral Vedana. You didn't swap anything, but the uh, feelings related to happiness changed. And so let that happen. When that happens again, this time be aware of that and see if you can understand it. what does it tell you? What possible insight can that lead you to? Now, when we're talking about uh, Vedana, anything that has to do with Vedana is going to be telling you something about. It has to do with insight into suffering. Because the flip side of suffering is pleasantness. You know, dukkha versus sukha. These are, these are the two 
So you're going to learn something about insight into dukkha uh, when any time the Vedana associated with something changes. So this is wonderful. You've got new sensations arising, and you've also got the Vedana changing along with it. So that's what you do with it, okay? So does anybody have any comments or anything about uh, this question and my answer to it? I, I just had, um, it's also regarding metta, when um, as something I've noticed that when I, 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 I have a way of first sending the phrase and then imagining that it's, that the person is smiling and then maybe that feeling in my body also sending it to them. But it, as, as a, I think as a result of um, a metacognitive introspective awareness, it's become very, very easy to see how my attention is flickering between these three um, things. Yeah. And is that just normal? Yeah, but uh, what's really important as you notice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, it's not like a stable attention in the same sense at one object. It's stable attention on three objects, kind of. Yeah. Okay. The, when you're developing stability of attention, your goal is to develop the kind of stable attention that doesn't require any kind of fixed object, that you don't need to hold on to one thing to allow that attention to become stable. And also another property of attention is a quality of being able to penetrate into uh, whatever it is that has arisen in your consciousness. This, this is what the word vipassana actually refers to, is that, that quality of seeing clearly when attention lands somewhere. So we use stable objects for a long time and attention is sustained on the same object in order to develop this. So our samadhi, our stable attention, develops through these stages of the beginner stage where it's, it, it's difficult to keep it on one thing uh, or to keep it fully on one thing uh, through the, uh, the stage is referred to as upachara samadhi and then apana samadhi where it becomes really stable and absorbed into something. The next stage beyond that is called kanika samadhi. And that's where no matter whether it, where attention lands and no matter where, how long it stays there, it can be for a fraction of a second, or it can stay on that same thing for five minutes. But even if it's a fraction of a second, while it's on it, it's totally on it. And there is this quality of clear seeing associated with it. So, uh, so where you're really going is this place where your attention can either encompass or move between many different things. So in stage eight, you're going to do practices where you're, you know, that this as your mind moves through the uh, um, uh, through the uh, the steps of dependent arising, where there's there's consciousness, uh, uh, then there's there's uh, uh, feeling arises, and uh, um, as a result of that feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, then craving arises, and then you reify the object, and so on and so on and so forth. This all happens very, very quickly. In stage eight, you're using that very stable and very penetrating attention to follow all these steps in a process and to see clearly what's happening in each step. So this is where all of this time spent on a single object is leading to, is being able to do the same thing on three or six or 16 or 100 things and to do it quickly or slowly or whatever is appropriate. And no matter how short or how long the duration of resting on an object, that attention is not only stable, but it brings that quality of vipassana, of clear seeing into it. This, of course, I mean, what have we been talking about all this time? We say you're observing things, you know, noticing what's happening, things like that. This is where insight comes from. If you 
don't try to analyze something. You just open yourself up to seeing it. And as it's changing, follow the changes. You know, a particular Vedana was there and then it's no longer there, so on and so forth. This is what's going to lead to insight. So this is why stable attention and vipassana are so important. And they're both functions of attention. They don't have anything to do with awareness. Awareness with sati plays its own role, which is every bit as important. But so what you're talking about, yes. Three things, six things, 10 things. Uh, the, more, the more things that attention can penetrate into uh, and the more fluid in your ability for attention to do that, then the more insight you're going to experience and the more rapidly it's going to develop. That was that was a good comment. Anybody have anything else to add? Um, I start to think that uh, loving kindness is just another wheel, it's just uh, a mental construct. Like you tend to see uh, a sign of rep uh, repulsive in someone, or a sign of something that's pleasant or desirable, but like it's just this wheel arises. Um, it's just a way of seeing things for a moment and then it disappears. Well, uh, you're probably familiar with the idea that uh, to be awakened is to develop not only wisdom, but compassion. Okay. Can you see that in practicing love and loving kindness, you're actually cultivating compassion. So if compassion arises as a result of, of insight and as a result of awakening, of incorporating that insight knowledge into the way you view everything, if, if compassion is a result of insight and awakening, then what are you doing when you practice loving kindness? is you are practicing, you are cultivating that way of perceiving things that is a reflection of developing anatta, of developing paticca samapada, of developing, uh, you know, uh, sunyata, you know, all of these factors that are, are components of insight leading to awakening. You are exercising your mind in a way that is going to move you towards the insights that make that a permanent state of mind. When you're practicing loving kindness, yes, it is only a temporary state that you're that is very much context dependent. You brought it into being by doing this particular practice. You'll be more successful one day than you will another. But what you're working towards when you're doing loving kindness meditation is the kind of insight that makes that not a transient state, but a permanent trait of the way you see the world. Loving kindness is an insight practice. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it is like uh, when I feel loving kindness, usually this, uh, like this feeling of self is usually decreases like, yeah, yeah. Right. And if you come to notice that, or if you have noticed it, obviously, the more you notice that, the more it begins to make sense in a larger picture, and the more likely are you to realize anatta at a deep level. Unfortunately, uh, when I was answering that first question and we began the session, I had paused my recording and I didn't realize it until we were already mostly finished with that first, with the answer to that first question. So um, I, unfortunately, I'm glad those that you were here, this, this was, I, I was answering Kim's question about awakening. Well, those of you who were here got to hear it, 
but you won't have access to that on the recording and the people that won't hear, uh, that weren't here won't be able to listen to that on the recording. So I, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm used to having somebody to help me uh, who makes sure that things get recorded. When it's up to me, I sometimes forget things like that to re like restarting my recording. So anyway, I do apologize for that. And uh, if any of you who are piqued by Kim's question and, and want to raise any aspects of it again in the future, feel in a future session, please feel free to. I'm, I know I don't need to address this to you that are here and that we're here, but to anybody who hears this part of the recording who wasn't present today, you know, if you are intrigued by that and would like to return to it, then just create your own question around the subject, okay? Thank you. Well, I'm going to save this very last question, Booners, or, or no, I think it's Jared's. Do we answer it? Yeah, it's Jared's question. I'm going to save this for another time and call it, call it a day as far as uh, this session goes. All right. So have a wonderful two weeks in between. And Thank you. Thank you, sir. You too. Bye. Bye. Until next time. Uh, I was curious, um, just to ask a very short question. Sure. Is there a way that you would approach, or a way that you would approach reading the uh, suttas sequentially? Well, um, do you you would need some assistance. I mean, the sequential readings, one of the most useful sequential readings that I found uh, is if you can, to the degree that you can, discern what the temporal sequence of that, because you can see, you can see how the Buddha's way of communicating things evolved as he encountered different situations and as the number of people with a number of different views and past experiences that he was teaching increased. Uh, unfortunately, they're not set out in that way. They, they're organized according to how long they are and all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with whether the sutta was delivered early in his teaching or late in his teaching. There has been, though, a lot of scholarly research done where people carefully examining the language, etc., of the suttas and the background events, certain historical events that can be identified in sequence, things like that. Scholars have done a lot of work towards arranging the suttas in uh, strata according to the early suttas and middle suttas and the later suttas. Uh, not necessarily terribly accurate, but to a degree that you can access that information, that's probably the most useful way to read the suttas. The big problem with the suttas is that they were transmitted orally for 500 years and inevitably were changed significantly. Are you familiar with the with game called, I, mean, I know it as the Chinese telephone game? You get a group of people and you write something on a piece of paper, you give it to the first person um, they read it, they whisper it to the next, and then they whisper it to the next. And you're going to get to the last person. You compare what they say to what's on a piece of paper, and it's dramatically changed. Well, the thing is that during that half century of oral transmission, uh, the suttas went through a lot of changes. As a matter of fact, uh, as many as at least 18 different schools developed and they had different versions of the suttas. So when we look at the suttas that have come down to us today, they were written down in Sri Lanka in the first century CE, they don't really, they've been changed a lot. We don't really know how closely they resemble what the Buddha actually taught, but it's, 
putting them in a temporal sequence to the degree that we can, I found extremely helpful in seeing the evolution of the Buddha's teaching and understanding more clearly what has been added to those suttas in order to make them consistent with later doctrines and what has been redacted from those suttas in order to keep them from conflicting with later doctrines. The closest of anything that I found that does that is a, is a book called The Life of the Buddha. And it's a collection of sutras that are organized as best the author uh, was able to uh, in the sequence that, that corresponds to his life, okay? So as far as something that's easily accessible without delving into a lot of uh, academic stuff, the easiest, most easily accessible collection of suttas that has been attempted to arrange in a temporal sequence is uh, The Life of the Buddha. I'm trying to remember the author of that, but it's The Life of the Buddha basically as told in the suttas. And uh, it can at least get you started on that. I, I think that's a very valuable sequence in which to read them. That huge number of suttas, there's a lot of repetition. There's the same suttas uh, with variations and of different lengths and everything else there. Um, yeah, the suttas is really a, a thicket of complications. <laughs> Actually, I tried to Google about a chronological sequence of the suttas and really came up with nothing. Right, yeah. Uh, and my question wasn't really about the chronological uh, so much as just uh, a sequence. I mean, like I started reading the middle dis middle length discourses. Mm -hmm. Somebody said that that was a, a good place to start. I think it was Sh Shyla Catherine talked yeah. about they all have a narrative style. So it's uh, there's a certain uh, and I have to admit that it, they're much easier reading than I had expected them to be. And then she talked about, well, and then the, uh, the collected or the connected discourses, that they're a good place to dive into just uh, studying topics. Yeah. yeah. And then she talked about the, the numerical discourses as being a good teacher's aid to set up lists to, to talk about. <laughs> well, I would I would agree with Shaila and Catherine on that, on um, on all of those. And yes, the the middle length discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya, are they're definitely the easiest and most satisfying to read. Uh, I all the the deep in Nikaya, probably discourses that have gone the undergone the most subsequent meddling. Okay. The Diga Nikaya. Yeah, the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses. Uh -huh. uh, not necessarily all of them. Some of them have some of them have a very natural progression that you know is sensible all the way. But a lot of them, these are the ones that there's been the most opportunity for uh, additions uh, or, and redactions, but also additions. Uh, the connected and numbered discourses are, these are basically a lot of discourses that have been created by, ex by extracting information from these other discourses and making them into separate smaller discourses um, and interrelated or connected discourses and things like that. They're all valuable in their own way. You know, uh, the development of themes in the longer discourses is useful. But as I say, they're really, really, uh, even more so than the middle length discourses, they, they're the ones that have undergone so much meddling subsequently. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I hope you have a good day. Well, thank you. Great, great next couple of weeks. You too. All right. And a productive writing schedule. Well, thank you. I will. <laughs> going, going very well, by the way.
Hope it keeps up. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. You, sir. Yeah.